Okay. Uh, your glasses are turning dark, which is... Uh, is that bad? A little, you have a, any clear glasses? I don't need glasses, I guess. Okay, if you could take, take them, them off. off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start at the beginning again to get on this tape. Where you're born, uh, date of birth, oh, that, okay. that sort of thing. All right, Steve. Your parents. Is it going? Yeah, it's going. Steve Tapas. I was born October 8, 1947 in Brooklyn and grew up uh, in Brooklyn till I was 10 or 11 years old and moved out to Long Island um, with that migration and finished high school in Long Island, in Long Island, Amityville and Merrick. And I uh, did a year of college, community college, and didn't really uh, take to college much. So I ended up moving into into New York, get, getting different jobs. About what year was this? Could you, this was 19. Thing? I moved into New York in 1967, so I was uh, 19 years old, and got a leaflet. I did different. Early 67, I got different jobs, you know, I ended up as a janitor at the new school and worked as an elevator operator for a while up on Central Park West. And I got a leaflet for the Pentagon demonstration, and which was an anti-war demonstration in October of 1967 where... Uh, a lot of people, it was 100,000 people came very, and it was kind of a, one of the more militant demonstrations. And people, I didn't know what it was. I'd never been to an anti-war demonstration, but it just seemed like a good idea. It just seemed like, like something was happening. And uh, I wasn't all that political, but I was facing the draft and I got a few leaflets and read a little bit about it. and. Being against the war seemed like a good thing. Civil rights, I, I was already supported civil rights, actually, even in high school. I went to, a, I went to the um, big march on Washington in 1963, where Martin Luther King made the famous speech, which was totally out of context. There was no reason for me to, no one would have thought that I'd go to that. I wasn't involved in anything civil rights uh, related. Um, I lived in a town that was half black, but I'd moved from there. My parents moved from there into a town on Long Island which was all white. But it just seemed like equal rights and civil rights and integration and all that seemed like a, it was only right. And it seemed like a big thing. Did that come so, out of uh, your church or religion or no, a little Democrat background? No, it, it was. In a lot of ways, it came out. It came out of nowhere. Now, my father was kind of a liberal, but he he wasn't. He didn't talk about it much. I mean, he so he wasn't opposed to me uh, going. And he had worked for a, um, he worked for an, a uh, kind of a liberal veterans organization. It was kind of a liberal answer to the American Legion. But it was, you know, very, it wasn't a militant organization. It was very straight liberal, kind of New Republic kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, they supported, they were Adlai Stevenson types. And, but he, you know, I, he didn't have any influence. I didn't even like him. So, I mean, so. You didn't he, like who? My father, you know. So it wasn't that he influenced me. Um, we didn't get along particularly well. And. So I went on that demonstration. I think actually a friend of mine said, hey, you want to go on this demonstration? Talking about 63 or 63? It's 1963. Yeah. A friend of mine in high school, we were like 14, 63, I'd been 15 years old. He says, you want to go to Washington this demonstration? I said, it sounds like it might be interesting. And, you know, get out of this nothing going on place. And then he went and asked his parents and they wouldn't let him go. So and I, already, I had already asked my parents, and they said, fine, go. So I went by myself, and I sat by myself on his train. People were very friendly, 
but I didn't. I wasn't part of a group. I wasn't part of anything. I just sat on the train and um, from Grant Central Station, took the train to Washington, got off the train, marched with everybody else, and uh, marched back, walked back to the train, got on the train, went home. Um, it was, I, and then and then I did a. They had my name and phone number and address and all that and. Some Long Island Coordinating Committee for Civil Rights would call me now and then and ask me if I wanted to hand out leaflets or something like that, and I did. But it, it wasn't something that you could, it was, they were old people, maybe they were church people, something, whatever they were, they weren't people that I, they weren't going to be friends. They were not my f peers. And so um, it was gone, and mostly, uh, you know, I was more into playing pool, and and I was kind of a gambler. So uh, I went off to the off to the city and got jobs, and then uh, one day somebody handed me a leaflet, said something about the draft and uh, the Pentagon demonstration, and then I read the Village Voice, and there was a full page ad for the uh, for this march on Washington. So I. That, and on the bottom of the ad, it said, if you want to volunteer and help out, prepare for this demonstration, come up to the office. So I went up to the office, and they had me stuffing envelopes. And, um, you know, so I, <clears throat> I, t I didn't become real friends with anybody there. Stu Albert was one of the people um, in that room, you know, stuffing envelopes, and I met him. And then I met, you know, some of the other people. But then I had this job at the new school as a janitor and then an SDS chapter there. So I started going to SDS meetings. And then I went to the Pentagon demonstration, got arrested there, and I came back and um, I was inspired. And I, I met people that, I met a lot of people. All of a sudden, I changed communities. I was living, I moved to the Lower East Side. Um, I started volunteering at the SDS office and then there was another demonstration then all of a sudden there's in, in that day during in those days there were demonstrations every week somewhere there were protests um, all about the same subject or mostly mostly the war you know or international things um, uh, then che, Gu che Guevara was killed on my birthday that year and there were, you know, demonstrations, uh, anti-imperialist thing, and then there would be some kind of, um, you know, civil rights related, related stuff. And then all of a sudden, I'm, you know, like overnight, I was part of the movement. And there were no close friendships in, the, in that, that were furthering that. You were a loner within the movement. No, no, no. So one, that that was there was that was a shift. All, you know, then after the, when I, when I came back from the demonstration and why, I went to the demonstration in Washington as, as a loner and I met people on the bus and I got a ride down there with people who were uh, street theater people and they, I just loved them. They were, they were the greatest. It was just a whole different world of people. It what was, did they do? They have puppets or? They did. They had, um. Big paper. It was the play was the War Monster play <laughs> that we performed in the street with these big paper mache. I guess you call them puppets. Uh, and I was in a we in a van with them, and I got a ride from New York. And they a couple of people got separated from the group, so they needed some help. So we had this dragon type puppet. And they, two people would be, and it was the war monster. And then they had a guy who was dressed kind of like, uh, you know, the businessman in the Monopoly game with the, with the top hat. And he would uh, feed children and, and soldiers and, um, and airplanes and bombs to the, to the war monster. And then the war monster would turn around and shit money uh, to, the, to the businessman. And I was the one in the in the back uh, handing out the, the money. So that was my theatrical debut. And and so then I got, so then they, you know, drive back and they had a loft and 
down in, uh, in the deep Lower East Side of Manhattan and had rent parties on Friday night and, and sang folk songs and I met other people there and then I started to work at the SDS office and then I made, and you know, now I'm part of a community. Now I have friends. Now I'm, you know, it, one great thing about it, about that, you know, there was a culture going on. All of my hair now by that time was getting a little longer. Um, you know, it's people who smoke dope, people who listen to a lot of music. And all of a sudden I was part of this new community on the Lower East Side. And um, I have to say out in the suburbs where I'd lived, you didn't know how to get from from where you knew these things were going on. You know, you could drive into the city and, and look around and you might see some hippies, but then you think, well, how could they be your friend? You know, you would even say, you know, your parents can't set up a play date. And all of a sudden now I had, uh, I, I changed communities. I got, I moved from this kind of um, suburban, know-nothing community, all-white community to, uh, um, to a, a group of people who thought that they were, <laughs> in a sense, were the center of the world, were right where it was happening. And, um, you know, and you'd meet people who were kind of sort of famous, you know, and um, you even you do things that got covered in the newspaper, you know, like demonstrations and stuff. It was exciting. And I spent that next year, you know, went to all the different demonstrations. I was at Columbia for the uh, student strike. I was in a building there for uh, 10 days, in the math building. And, and, and working at SDS, I raised money f to get a new office and um, set up a print shop. And I learned how to print. And one thing that, I mean, it's probably not as true now in the, with the internet, but in those days, printing was a very valuable uh, skill. That there were never enough printers. Because nobody joins a, a movement so that they can sit in a tiny room running a printing press getting covered with ink. Um, you need for somebody to do that. So when I did that, um, I became sought after. And so uh, some people from, from Chicago came to talk to me, Jeff Jones and Bernadine, I think, and, uh, and said that I, they wanted me to move to Chicago and work in the SDS national office. And I said, I didn't want to just print. And they said, no, no, you do you could be campus traveler and you can like coordinate things and do this and that. And so I moved out to Chicago. And um, from there, I met Mike James, uh, who was not rising up angry, he didn't exist at the time. He was a member of JOIN, which did community organizing in Uptown in Chicago. And so, you know, I hung around with him, uh, other people in the national office, and then I met this guy, Noel Ignaton, who was uh, doing factory organizing at International Harvester. And he convinced me that I should go work in a factory. And I worked at International Harvester down on 31st Street and Western Avenue on the south, near south side of Chicago. And it's since been shut down. But, um, and we, <clears throat> so at this time I was working I did some stuff for SDS. I was working in the factory, um, and I was hanging around with Mike James, who was trying to put together. Join fell apart. Join ended, and so he wanted to start a new organization and put out a newspaper. Let's talk about, in terms of someone hearing this. The big picture is what were these people organizing to do, and what was their uh, vision, or what did they expect to happen? Could you? kind of tell that if you're telling it to a complete stranger from the future? <clears throat> um, well, the, the major issues, the major issue was uh, was the war in Vietnam. Let me just get a... Hold this. <clears throat> Sorry about that. 
people were upset about the war and well, and again, the my first, first time when I said I went to the demonstration, I thought of that as an anti-war demonstration. There's a war; it's a bad war. The liberals don't like it. The conservatives do. I quickly learned when I at the uh, I remember with the pageant players, the theater group, coming back on the bus, uh, not on the, uh, on the, in their van, and I'm, and I'm sitting talking, you know, with the other people. Now they were. They, they were smart and they were, they'd were they been political for a long time. I'd been political for about a week and a half. And although I, I immediately thought I kind of like joined the church, and now I'm part of the anti-war movement. I'm an anti-war guy and um, countercultural or whatever, against the establishment. So it's all, all those things went together. I mean, it was a whole culture. I like, it was rock and roll. It was... Um, it was Bob Dylan. It was protest mu- music. It was uh, it was dancing in the streets and theater, and getting high and smoking dope and and anti-establishment and hippie clothes and no more suits and that kind of stuff. So there was a real count. So we lived in, in a count. We had our own culture, um, and. In addition, but we, we were the political ones of that culture. So a lot of people who were, everybody who was a hippie wasn't reading political tracts at night. They were, um, some people just, you know, liked the music and liked to dance or something, you know. But on the other hand, they were anti-establishment in that they were anti-authoritarian, didn't want to be, you know. This was a time when colleges still had dress codes. Um... Women, women had curfews, in a, you know, in a, this was about the time when they were protesting that. Depends on what, if you were in a college in New York City, the women probably didn't have different curfews from the, the girls didn't have different curfews from the boys in those days. But in small colleges around, you know, and not in the city, um, it was, it was this, that hadn't changed since the 1950s. There were, uh, You know, mixed race dating wasn't, you know, raised eyebrows in the the mid to late 60s. Um, And feminism was, I guess it was, um, it was there. When I first came into the movement, I didn't know about it, but it didn't take long, I'd say, you know, by 19, the beginning of 1968, you couldn't get away with really sexist remarks. You couldn't get away with, it was a turning point. Before that, in early, which I've learned later, in early SDS, women got the coffee and the men made the speeches. In SNCC in the South, women did all the work, all the hard work, and they said men didn't, you know, some of the histories I read, they say, that, you know, all the men, the, and especially the preachers, they didn't do anything unless there was a microphone there or a TV camera. Then then they put they actually pushed the women out of the way and said okay now it's time for the men to talk and then as soon as the cameras were gone the women could start like writing the thing and you know putting out the pamphlets and so forth um but anyway i so there was a civil rights movement but when i came into the movement the that was not long after SNCC asked the white people to leave, to, uh, to that they wanted SNCC to be an all-black organization, that they appreciated the help that white people had given in the struggle in the South, but it was time for the black people to take over the organization, and if white people want to be helpful, what they should do is go organize in the white community, because that's where all the racism was, and they should go try to change white people's minds instead of trying to organize black people and especially black people in the south was that in 67 or 68 i mean was it after martin luther king or it was it was earlier it was um i don't really remember the date because i wasn't you know it was around that that 66 67 time um that there was in 67 i believe early 67 there was a, a national convention of for new politics where um the the black caucus 
kind of stood up and said that they should have all the votes or something like that, and, and the white people shouldn't be allowed to vote in a civil rights organization. And that may not be exactly right, but there was a split, and it became difficult. That was the turning point where there were no longer, ironically enough, there were no longer integrated organizations very much within the... Uh, or, let me say it a different way. There were no longer integrated radical organizations within the black movement. It became a black nationalist movement or a, you know, a black freedom movement. But, um, and if there's ever, if you had to say when, when the split was finalized, I guess you could say when Martin Luther King was assassinated. At that point, what blacks were pretty much finished. Young blacks were, didn't really want to hang out with whites very much. Um, I mean, I heard an interesting, I don't know how, if I can, use no, a little tangent here. I heard this interview with Terry Gross, uh, you know, maybe five years ago, about, who's now, who's the guy? Um, it was a musician, the name will come to me. The musician will come to, uh, from, Memphis Shoals from Stax Music, and he he wrote he co-wrote like Midnight Hour with Wilson Pickett, and um, I just went blank on his name. But anyway, he was a white guy who uh, musician who wrote a lot of the the songs like Midnight Hour. He he co-wrote stuff with Otis Redding, um, and perfectly. Uh, friendly part of the, you know, he worked there for years. These were his closest friends, his only friend. He was totally part of that, part of that scene. And he tells about how, um, as in six, 1968, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't comfortable, but there wasn't as much of a place for him. That it was became kind of so much of an all black recording studio, and the music and the culture and everything was so much more all black that they didn't really want a, uh, a white guy writing their songs with them and so forth. Although they, on an individual level, he didn't lose any friends. Nobody didn't like him. No individual didn't like him. He, he told it much back, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember this. But the point was, Terry Gross asked him, do you remember, you know, when exactly this happened? He says, I could tell you the day it happened. This is the day Martin Luther King was shot. Black people didn't trust white people anymore. He says they just were mad at us. They would, they just, it very subtly, even if you had a good friend who was white, they were just kind of mad at white people. And so, um, this isn't what I normally talk, you know, think about because it's, uh, it, I mean, so I'm not as, I don't, I don't feel like I have it, have the explanation clear and down, but when I came into the movement, the organ, you know, SDS was all white. S and what happened was a lot of those people who had been doing civil rights work in the South or anywhere, they'd maybe been in CORE or, uh, you know, uh, SNCC chapters and things like that, needed to find another outlet for their political work and that's when the uh, when they joined they started SDS chapters and ca on campuses all over the country and focused on anti-war work or c there were two factions in SDS at that point in 66 67 one was you get social change by one-on-one -on -one community organizing that you go into the community and you win kind of a Saul Alinsky model, maybe a little more political. And you go into the community and find out what people need, what are the problems in the community, housing, welfare, welfare rights, whatever. You go into poor communities and you help them organize um, to improve their lives. And through that process of organizing, they learn more, they, you raise the consciousness and we get social change. Um, other people were saying that we have a genocidal, imperialist, immoral, illegal war in Vietnam. Um, 
Americans are getting killed, Vietnamese are getting slaughtered, and we have to st we have to stop this war. It's just wrong, and um, and the way that it was expressed was through large scale uh, demonstrations, such as there was a couple of huge ones, like in New York on Fifth the Fifth there was the Fifth Avenue Peace Parade Committee. And they had, you know, half a million people, a million people walking down Fifth Avenue against the war in 66, 67. And, these, and then the Pentagon demonstration and then other large demonstrations. Now, these two positions, nobody really thought they were mutually exclusive. It's not like everybody had, you know, there's one, white, one right way to change the world. Um, but people had different inclinations. Not everybody wanted to go knock on doors and help help people figure out how to how to improve, you know, how to have a rent strike and make their building better. Um, and it seemed to other people, you know, the idea of stopping the war, and it, especially on campuses. If you're in school, you, you have to quit school to go organize poor people. But if you're in college, you could stay in college. And SDS developed all these targets, basically, on the campus. You could fight IDA, the Institute for Defense Analysis. You could fight the campus recruiters like Dow Chemical, which made napalm. You could um, picket or block the CIA coming in on the job fair day. And um, you can protest speakers when they came in, you know, if um, State Department people came in. So there were a lot of things you could do. You could demand that they divest investments from defense, you know, their, from their endowments, that they divest their investments from um, corporations which did defense work. So there was all, there was all, all, that kind, all that kind of stuff. And both of those were going on. And then there was, uh, let's call it a, a competition more than a tension. Of which you know it's like, which is uh, which is your favorite way of changing the world, or which do you kind of work did you want to do, and you know SDS for the most part, SDS's position really the most popular position was to do the anti-war work, but on the campus, and so SDS tended not to get involved in the large-scale national organization, national mobilizations. That was a different group, like the Mobilization Committee, which did the Democratic National Convention. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, people, people like Dave Dellinger and Rennie Davis and Tom Hayden. And then there were uh, other people who did uh, the Newark, Newark Community Union, which organized in Newark. And then there was some Detroit people, and Join was, uh, was the one in Chicago. So that was the, that's the context of when I came to Chicago, that's what was going on. There was a Demo it was right out. I came right after the Democratic Convention, um, which is where I met Mike James. You came after or during? I came to the Democratic Convention just as a participant. And um, SDS did not endorse the protests. Uh, then once they were happening, this is what SDS did on all these things. The, once it's happening, then SDS would say, okay, we should give it critical support because they have some of the explanations wrong uh, about why. Okay. Let, me, let me move this a little bit. Cause that, that's a, an interesting part that no one's uh, mentioned. That is all SDS history, not rising up angry. Yeah, but, uh, well, it's all connected. Uh, I'm curious. <clears throat> about the flow of individuals back and forth, because people do change their minds. They reevaluate positions, and that's the nature of politics. Uh, who was in SDS that was uh, reluctant to support the Democratic Convention protests? Well, certainly the majority. Um, meaning the leadership in Chicago, or meaning across the country? Yeah, across the country. I would say, the, well, first of all, 
I, I, I don't know. I don't want to get, really get into all the different factions. You know, the people like progressive labor and those. Sort of, the more Marxist factions believe that it was the working class that leads the revolution, and you should be going into. You know, you should be making alliances that, um, with the working class, and that the large-scale demonstrations alienate the working class, uh, which was, which is symbolized by the famous. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that happened once, or maybe never happened. In this case, it did happen that the construction workers in New York attacked the demonstrators um, for being unpatriotic, and so saying that just and just provoking a bunch of hippies in the street with signs that look anti-American just pr uh, actually alienates more people than it wins over. Uh, that's the argument against the. Uh, the, the big demonstrations. The other ones were that it, it gets the gets big publicity. Let's shows the whole world uh, how many that that a significant part of the country is is against the war, and it excites the young people um, who are sort of against the war. It gives them a uh, a movement to be part of, and. Uh, And so that's that's the argument against against for for and against the uh, big demonstrations. The then there's the dated. The, it's a lo the other line is that it's a long haul. It's years and years of day-to-day -day organizing, building local organizations, changing consciousness, educating people, winning small winning small battles, getting a feeling that we can change things. Yeah, my nose just. Hmm, I'm curious because uh, you were in, you were moved to Chicago to be part of that printing organization in '68. It was so right after the Democratic convention was August '68. Oh. I went back to New York, and um, a month later, they convinced me to uh, to come and work in Chicago. That it would be, you know, you gotta remember I was I'm new. I'd been in the movement, you know, eight, less than a year, and so now. Um, it was, it was thought of. It's a, um, it's growth, it's development, it's learning more, it's meeting more people, it's being able to, you know, do do more work, mm -hmm. make a, make, have a bigger effect, that kind of stuff, and, and so then, uh, I was in a, in some ways I was. It's a fortunate position because in some ways I had a menu here of, uh, of different kinds of work I could do. I mean, I could be a bureaucrat in the office and print, and that could be my role. Um, you know, like I did the mailings and sending out the newspapers and things like that. Um, or I could go work in a factory. And what I liked about, by the way, working in a factory is a UAW plant. I made a lot of money, at least it was, I think, $3.30 an hour, which uh, I didn't make any. SDS paid us, um, I think, $15 a week. So, which you could, and they get, and we, there was a staff apartment with a lot of people sleeping on the floor. And you couldn't really even eat, eat on, uh, eat cheap food on that. So, you had to come up with another, hustle to come up with another five ten dollars a week just to get by and then I worked in a factory and it's um and I was three three was that it was over a hundred dollars a week coming in it was you know you, you really really did enter my mind that if everybody could get a UAW wage that we didn't need to like make a revolution but it was and in those days I had no trouble getting the job to you know they were making a lot of tractors and business, you know, this, the economy was booming, I guess, in 68. It seemed that way because I just went went down and applied and uh, they gave me the job. And <clears throat> and so, uh, so there was, there was factory organizing, there was working in the office, I could, you know, there was um, some people like Peter Kuttner who, you also interviewed. He was he he had skills in filmmaking, and so he did stuff with an organization called Newsreel, 
which made radical films. You know, films, actually what they did mostly in the early stages was they filmed the demonstrations and they filmed political work. And then it was, and, and with the idea that it was an organizing tool for organizers to, and we used it in Rising Up Angry later on, you know, you get a bunch of kids together and then you show them a film about the Black Panthers or about the demonstrations in San Francisco or the demonstrations in New York and kind of get them, get, you know, get them inspired. And, uh, and then I met Mike James who talked about um, organizing white working class kids. Though was, also, I haven't mentioned the Panthers. The Panthers, the Panthers were, how would you say it, the follow up, the sequel. And the, the sequel to, to SNCC and a lot of the urban, northern urban sequel to SNCC. And coming from New York, I hadn't heard of the Panthers, which started in Oakland, California, but in Huey Newton. But when I got to Chicago, it was kind of the peak of, uh, of, the, of the Panthers. I think Huey Newton had just been in prison. Uh, so it was the free Huey rallies. Uh, they had, there were shootouts and and a lot, and then the, a Chicago chapter was started by Fred Hampton and Bobby Rush, and they used to have rallies. Some of them in the church down on uh, Ashland Avenue, right near, right near uh, the SDS office, and some of them in you know parks and uh, different places. And Fred Hampton was the most charismatic, brilliant speaker I'd ever heard. It, he was just amazing and I'd met him actually we said when I was working in the factory a lot of black workers at International Harvester and the guy I worked with set up meetings on Friday afternoons after work at the Panther office and we met with Fred Hampton about I don't know 10 of us 10 or 12 of us two of us were white the rest were all black and uh, we used to go for political education with Fred Hampton and he would lead a little discussion and just his presence was, he's the same age as me. We're both 20 or 21 years old. And he was just, he was the chairman. He, there was no question, the, the authority he had, the, the people just listened to what he said. He, um, but mostly he was so eloquent. And, um, you know, I don't know what you're doing here, but you could, with, with, with this footage, if you could splice in, some of that footage, it's available, of Fred Hampton, you know, Fred Hampton's speeches. Um, he was famous for his lines, because that's when the FBI, COINTELPRO, which I don't know how to explain all that, but the, uh, there were a lot of shootouts with the Panthers, and Panthers were getting shot. Eldridge Cleaver was, was shot and, and in prison, and Huey Newton was shot and in prison. And he says, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. You can chase a freedom fighter all around the world, but you can't chase the freedom fight. Um, you can kill a li liberator, but you can't kill liberation. You know, and um, and then you know, and he <clears throat> he'd say, you know, you dare to struggle, you dare to win. Don't dare to struggle, you don't deserve to win. And, and he'd just go on like that for like an hour, and people would just be mesmerized by him. And he he you know, they'd have him chanting and stomping their feet and clapping their hands. He was brilliant. And that's why they killed him. I mean, I think that um, there was no question. He was, he was a special person, you know, kind of, I don't want to compare What was going on in, in, you know, was uh, Rising Up Anger was somehow connected with the Panthers, like in communication in the weeks before he got killed or in the months before? And that well, you know, we, um, we had friendly relations. Um, they, they were starting up, you know, they, they started uh, with a lot of high school students. There was a student, there was a high school student strike in, I think, 67 or something like that, or black students st strike. Um, and Fred Hampton, I think, was one of the leaders of that. And then they started the, the Black Panther Party, and they had these rallies, and we would, we would uh, you know, go to all the rallies, and uh, we, would bring pe we would bring white kids from the neighborhoods, uh, to see the Panthers, and they were afraid to go. They said, you know, we'll get killed. 
And so that was a great, for us, it was a great experience to, uh, for them, you know, to put people through, was to go to a rally and find out that the Panthers weren't going to kill them. And the Panthers always talked about um, multiracial, a multiracial revolution. They were not nationalists in their rhetoric at all. I mean, they were an all-black organization, but what they wanted, they said they were, they, because they wanted to have alliances with other communities. So everybody organizes their own community, and Fred Hampton always finished his speeches, you know, he'd say, and we want um, <clears throat> black power to black people, red power to red people, white power to white people, all power to all the people. Every speech, you you know, you finish like that. So um, we set we set up some. Uh, we showed the Panther. There was a Panther movie that that Newsreel made. We'd have a Panther speaker. We go to the. We take uh, a group of, you know, gangbanger type white kids um, from the neighborhoods to a, to Panther events. Uh, when the conspiracy trial, which would have been. Um, I guess that was 1969 because the convention was in 68 and then they were indicted and then the trial was in 1969. It must have been in the winter because I remember it was cold and there were these demonstrations out in front of the federal building and Fred Hampton would would speak with and Bobby Seale was being uh, was gagged and bound in the courtroom and Fred Hampton would speak outside and there would be uh, and there would be these, uh, you know, rallies outside, and that would and a lot of and a lot of black people at those rallies. Those I think there were a lot of white people too. I don't remember the proportions, but it was significant. You know, some of them might have when Bobby Seale was there, probably were more blacks than whites. Um, but we we took people. We had that one sign. I think you made the sign that said uh, "Revolutionary Greece of Chicago." support uh, Bobby Seale and the Conspiracy 8. And um, the, so our concept of community organizing wasn't to go to the white neighborhood and find out what's bothering you and, you know, help you make your life a little bit better. What we wanted to do was, was be a vehicle so that the white kids who were uh, isolated in their neighborhoods. They hung around in a park on their corner and they never went anywhere else. And they did, and that was their turf and they defended their turf. And we showed them that it was safe to go to Lincoln Park and that they that you know they thought that every other gang, you know, that you that you weren't allowed to go in another gang's turf. Uh, you'd be attacked or you weren't allowed to go in another races another racial groups um, turf, they would attack, and you know there's truth to that to a certain extent. It also depends how you enter and how you what you're doing there. Um, and so we brought people. First of all, we brought people not just from one neighborhood at a time to places, but we try to get a group of you know 30, 40, 50 people um, to meet somewhere and all go together on some demonstration, whether it be an anti-war demonstration, where We'd show them that the hippies, the hippie demonstrators aren't so bad, or we'd take them to a Panther rally, or young, we did things with the Young Lords, the Puerto Rican neighborhood organization. And, um, and that was, so just that in itself, even if we didn't accomplish anything, win any demands, we changed, we changed the lives of, of the participants. Um, it just opened them up to like new ideas that you know uh, later on you you know if you if you well in your other interviews you get those stories is that um, it really made a difference and it just opened these these were people who would never if we didn't show them the way I mean they might have found it somewhere else in a community college somebody they meet to work whatever but our thing was to build an organization that that introduced people to new ideas, and that was. Uh, I'm thinking now, you know, whenever we had questions about whether it was all worth it, kind of things, it was worth it in itself for having opened up the minds of 
uh, of, of young working class white kids that it turned out they ended up not being racist. Now maybe they wouldn't have been so racist anyway, but maybe these were the ones who were not inclined toward being racist. And that's probably true, but um, it was, it was um, a nice force that we created. We actually create, we didn't go into a neighborhood to see how we can help them just do, be like the kind of neighborhood they are and, and stay the same but just better. We try to create a new, we were a revolution, we added a new factor to the community. You know, you got the kids that hang out here and the kids who hang out there and the ones who go to work and the ones who go in the army. And then there were the revolutionary people. <laughs> and it was, oh yeah, I'll rise up angry. They're, those revolutionary guys, nah, I don't like to hang around with them, but they, well, they're all right, they're not so bad. And that in itself was worthwhile, that, that, that we, it, we, we were real. It legitimized the uh, yeah. persona or a... Uh... That it legitimized the whole uh, way, of, a way of thinking that it was one of your choices. I mean, they may have, you know, they may have had a vegetable plate on, on the menu, you know, in the restaurant that not too many people ordered, but it's nice to know it's there. It was like a legitimate thing to have. A tuna fish sandwich, nobody, I don't know anybody ever ordered a tuna fish sandwich, maybe a girl, but... It's nice to see it's there. And we were, all of a sudden, we were on the menu of, uh, of, of people's choices. Uh, for example, people would think they had to go in the army. You know, they, you get called, you go. And all of a sudden, there was this choice. Well, you could try to figure out a way to beat it. You could try, you could resist it. You could get doctor's notes. You could... Um, you know, postpone it. You could, you know, that uh, people would get arrested you know, and for various kinds of things like, let's say, disorderly conduct, curf kids with curfew violations, things like that. We'd get them lawyers and you'd say, oh, there's ways you can beat the system and, and you can organize and, and change things. So... Uh, kind of skill training? Is it what? Is it skill training, knowledge and skill training, that there are options? Um, is this well, knowledge, this? certainly. Some of it was, yeah, some of it was skills, or some of it, it's more like social, I hate to use this term, because it's, it's very 21st century, but, you know, it's, it's, it's social networking. And we talked about, um, I mean, we could see the networks, you know. We, we would meet, you know, we'd meet, meet some kids on the corner, and and we're talking about conditions here. Then they say, "Well, my brother works in a factory over there at Stuart Warner, you know, or something like that." And then we'd say, "Well, let's get together with him, and then we can get some factory guys." Then you get there were the guys on the south side who were a little bit nervous about going to the anti-war demonstration. And I found out one of the reasons was the leader of the the old leader of the gang. I mean, he was like 21 years old, but the guy he was just coming back from Vietnam and he was getting out of the army and they didn't they didn't want to go to the anti war demonstration because they were afraid Dave would find out and he'd be mad at him and he was a tough guy he was the toughest guy in the gang and he's just coming back from Vietnam so you don't want him to find out that you were protesting the war and so when he came home it turned out that he was more against the war than anybody you know and and, um, and he <clears throat> And so that just, you know, so all of a sudden now we're having meetings and he's telling stories and we could introduce those guys to VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War people. And we had a group of, you know, a veterans group. And, you know, you could see how all of a sudden people thought every, all these things were isolated. You know, that if you worked at Stuart Warner, you didn't ever talk to people. You know, you w went there, you, you went home. And maybe in a bowling league once a week with the other guys. But um, now all of a sudden, you know, we're op opening up all the networks. And then we put, then, you know, uh, we had the newspaper, which was really the, the center, of, especially in the earliest days. We had a newspaper which gave us an excuse to go around to all the neighborhoods. You know, you pull up, you pull Could you up, describe the newspaper? We don't news have a copy here. The newspaper was, I'm trying to remember, I think six. 16, 
four times four, sixteen. It was either sixteen or twenty-four pages. I don't, I don't really remember. Um, and there would be the co the cover was a big picture, you know, was a, a with a, a big logo and then a picture of something with a a, a slogan. A couple of women with their fists up saying, um, you know, sisters are equal to or something like that. And um, thing about the we did a thing about the American Indians after uh, uh, Wounded Knee. Uh, things, you know, but, you know, things about health care, things about education. And then there would be a couple of, um, there would be an editorial, there would be a ser couple of serious articles, like about the war in Vietnam, about the Black Panthers, about a strike somewhere. Uh, and then the, the middle section was what we called the Stone Grease Grapevine. And that had little tidbits of news um, from all the neighborhoods. And we put, I mean, they weren't even newsworthy events. Um, but we put people's pictures in, we take pictures, and we'd have you know, everybody lined up in their leather jackets, holding their fists up, and you know, we say a message, a mess, message from you know the the uh, north north side Hudsons and Core that uh, they say power to the people, and we're going to do our best to stop the gang banging and racial and race fighting, and we're going to try to get together, fight the pigs, end the war, and have power to the people. <laughs> and you know we kind of put the words in their mouth and we put that picture and then we can go back hey you got your picture in here and everybody they never had their picture in the paper so everybody take the paper and they give it to all their friends and meanwhile we have all the stuff about feminism and and all very I have to say I would say that it was well people told us that it was really well written in a language in, in a um, in a, in a non-intellectual, regular language, and, and use uh, and in a way that actually people did read the whole paper. We had music reviews um, tending toward, you know, like we'd have one about Creedence Clearwater Revival and Fortunate Son and thing, you know, stuff like that. Explaining the words, we talk about. Um, <clears throat> we had, you know, some of the some of the more feminist feminist music. Uh, you know, and uh, what was that? I don't I'm trying. You know, I, I mean, just songs that uh, I don't want to say that. Uh, I, you know, I, I just my mind went blank on this. But there were a lot of lot of songs that had uh, women standing up and uh, respect, for example, uh, which was both racial and feminist and stuff. You know, by Aretha Franklin. And so we could, you know, we'd use music and stuff like that. We'd talk about drugs. What we, our line on drugs was that we all like to get high and um, uh, keep it a little bit in perspective. Don't be high all the time, and stick to st stick to um, weed and and occasional. I think our our pref pref preferences were weed and occasional acid now and then, but um, don't overdo it and stay away from speed, downers, and heroin. And, uh, and then we ran several articles against heroin. Cause it, and, and actually, in my experience during those years, uh, downers, barbiturates, were a more serious problem, especially people would drink. And, you know, the, the couple, a couple of uh, barbiturates and a couple of beers could kill you. And we'd run pictures of people who, who you know, overdose from different neighborhoods in memoriam, and and then run an article about how, um, you know, intelligent drug use, um, stuff like that. We had stuff on birth control and abortions, and so, but then you had a cartoon on the back page, and uh, a lot of stuff on ga on on gang banging and and. Our line was, we shouldn't be fighting each other. If you're going to fight, you know, we got a lot of anger. So if you're going to fight anybody, fight the police, fight the pigs. Um, Must fight make the you rich popular people. with the police, huh? Yeah, you know, the police did. So we got, re we got arrested a lot, you know, selling the paper. Um, you know, I think the, a lot of cops' attitude is they'd look at the paper and they'd arrest us and say, you know, what about, you know, First Amendment? And, all that. and they look, they're I don't know what it is. 
<laughs> there ought to be a law against you saying this stuff. And, you know, that was the mild form. Then there were others, you know, they would, you know, people get pushed around, um, just chased off the street. You know, you can't, um, I don't care what the law is and what are you going to do? I mean, you, uh, and so there was that kind of stuff. But we were out on the, on the corners uh, in the shopping areas. You, you know all those in Chicago where they have the diagonal streets like Milwaukee and Cicero or Lincoln and Belmont or Milwaukee and Division. Um, also down on <clears throat> uh, in Old Town and in uh, down even on state, even even down downtown Chicago, we'd sell a lot of papers. We so, tended to sell the seed sold. Their best corners were North and Wells and State and Madison. Our best corners were like Lincoln and Belmont, uh, Milwaukee and North Avenue. Um, you know that used to be Wee Bolts and Goldblatts and all that was down there. And uh, also up on Wilson and Broadway. Uh, and and then you know at L stop sometimes in the morning we go we go out and also we went to all the high schools we systematically went to all the high schools in the city uh, or all the what we would con are the ones that were especially our demographic um, Sen High School and uh, you know the one. Uh, sure, it went to, we went to Shores, we went to Wells. Uh, I'm thinking of the ones I got arrested at, you know. Um, <laughs> arrested? How many people got arrested and how many times? And what arrested well, for? I got arrested Arrest a lot of times where they kind of intimidate you, they'd yell at you, they'd throw you in the cell for a couple hours. And then finally, they'd just tell you to leave. Or they would charge, or more likely, a lot of the times, they'd say, oh, it's disorderly conduct, illegally selling papers, and, or, or whatever, disturbing the peace. And you get out, you'd be like a 25 or $50 bond. And so somebody bail you out, then you have to go to court. And then when you get to court, the cop would never show up. And so they either you'd have to come back or the lawyer would move to have it dismissed and the judge would look at it selling papers on the corner. What is this? Get this out of here. So it was a pain to us. I mean, we had a, first of all, it cost us $50. We got uh, papers taken away. They, you know, nobody really likes to spend a day in a lockup. And then they'd, uh, but they'd always, they'd always throw it out. I mean, it, so it wasn't like you, you, you didn't get a record. It was, it, the arrest wasn't even on, on the books anymore or anything like that. But, it, you know, that was just a harassment. Um, you know, there were some, some neighborhoods, like out on the, like by Logan Square, there was a Sergeant Jankowski who told me that um, it's, he's, <clears throat> he's in charge of, his, in his district, he's in charge of this stuff. He says, he told us, go, go sell your papers in Lincoln Park, in Old Town, go downtown, go by the college campuses. He said, I live in this neighborhood and you're not selling paper. If I see you, he says, if I, if I see you, you're arrested. If I have to make up charges, we'll make up charges. He said, um, you're not welcome in this neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, he broke into, you know, they came, I lived with Mike James on Armitage and Kedzie, and they came in with fire inspectors one morning. We heard, we, 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 have an, we were informed that there are fire hazards in your apartment. Um, and we have to check, and we're going to check every day. <laughs> and so he says, "I'd advise you not to, not to live around here." <laughs> so then we'd have to, we'd live, we'd get other apartments in the neighborhood, but he always get it under a fake name, and it was, you know, they they did make it difficult. Um, but you know, it, and so we tended to get our apartments a little closer to the lake. He says, go close, he said, go closer to the lake. They like you kind of people over there. <laughs> He's gone Lincoln Avenue. <laughs> he says, they're tolerant over there. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, he, he always told me he was going to kill me. But he, uh, in fact, 
I realized pretty soon that that there was a kind of affection about it. I think he actually kind of liked me. And what he was trying to do was to scare me out of this ridiculousness. And which is the difference between black people and white people. They really did kill black people for such the white because, you know, the white dominated cops, they could kill these rioting black people. But, uh, you know, they, it was, I think I reminded him of his cousin or something, you know, and, and or his nephew. And so, uh, so they, you know, they didn't kill white people. They only killed, they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't kill me and Mike James, but they killed Fred Hampton. And it was, there was never a question that, that, you know, it would, it would cause too much trouble to, to go around killing white anti-war organizers. But black rioters, black nationalists, Muslims, terrorists, whatever, it's a different story. So anyway, where I am now is still at the earliest stages of rising up angry. And so I should say something about, and it, you know, it blurs together for me 40 years later, but that was, that's how we got started. And that's how we recruited a bunch of people. Now we could have recruited people from college campuses, you know, as you were saying, we were saying before, um, you know, not everybody, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't work for in the black movement. There was no more voter registration, you know, drives like, you know, from uh, like SNCC had in the early years. And um, when, when, with all the factionalism and, and SDS and the craziness going on, there were a lot of people who really wanted to just do day-to-day -day, um, political work. And they're not sure how to do it, and they, some of, you know, they knew some of us, and we had a lot of people that came, oh, I'd like to come work with you guys. And we turned them down. We didn't want to be overwhelmed. We didn't want like 50 or 100 SD, former SDS members who were going to like organize white working class street kids in Chicago to make a revolution and, and change the system that we didn't think that the people we were um, trying to organize would, would be organized by middle class college students. These were the kids who didn't go to college and there was one as a class resentment. But um, as Mike James used to say, we have to be careful that they don't get out-talked, out-articulated and out-organized by this by a, a surge of college, you know, college type kids, even if they came from poor families, that wasn't the point. The, that we ha wanted to have an organization where they felt that it was their organization. And, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old, 18, 19 year old kids from, from a, a white working class neighborhood, they weren't going to go to a meeting with um, where people are, like, uh, are arguing policy positions, and um, and we wanted we wanted them to feel like they it was an organization that just about everybody was kind of like them. Yeah. Did you it feel at times like it was like a being a church pastor or something or? No, I don't think that with, that analogy with, ever came in. You know, I think we were Che Guevara before we were church pastors. Uh, <laughs> we were, you know, I mean, if we were going to fantasize about and 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 get grandiose about ourselves, it would have been more in the way of early early Che Guevara organizing the peasants in the hills, um, recruiting them to the guerrilla band, than we were. Um, teaching, you know, teaching. We we didn't we didn't come across. I suppose a lot of the people thought of two questions here. One is what they thought of us, but how we saw ourselves was I wasn't that much older than I was. Twenty one years old. Um, 
there came a time a few years later where some of us didn't really like going to the high schools anymore. You know, um, it just didn't, it, it just seemed a little weird to be 23 year old people pulling up in cars, you know, rapping to the high school kids. Um, but when, you know, but we had younger people doing that, you know, but it, when we started, I was, tw I was only 21, 22 years old. Um, and Mike James, a couple of years older than me, but you know, we were, uh, we wore leather jackets. We really thought of us, we, we both, on one hand, we melded in, or melted, <laughs> we, we fit in with the, uh, merged with the people, you know, and had pretty much our style and manner, we thought to a large extent was, it wasn't the same. You know, if you look carefully, you can see that we were a little bit different, but uh, older, um, a little more serious. Maybe we, you know, seemed to have a line down, you know, that we knew what we were talking about. I mean, had a mission. Um, on the other hand, we were compatible. We weren't like a, an alien race or an alien. Um, culture or ideology we listened to the same music and we had these people's dances which were um you know which was really unique in the movement these kind of things i mean there were fundraising benefits and and things like that everybody did that you know but what we had was neighborhood dances um neighborhood we it turned out in the long run we had to have mostly on lincoln avenue around that neighborhood because other places wouldn't let us have them. But we had things in the Wobbly Hall and in some of the um, places, uh, Alice's Restaurant on Lincoln Avenue. And we'd have five, 600 people from all of it. You know, it was, it was not a movement-y thing. It was a neighborhood people's thing. And we had local bands from the different, you know, people would come to see that we'd have a band, you know, of people from the South, you know, 95th Street or something like that and uh, and <clears throat> you know they get a chance to play and all their friends would come up and it only cost a dollar for our dances and um, and if you didn't pay a lot of people would manage to get in free and so we had these big events which really gave us the uh, gave the imp and people the people who working take say selling tickets at the door doing security doing cleanup were people from the neighborhoods. So we really had the feel of a people's organization. That it, these were, it wasn't that they were going to like, like it was like, like one of these, you know, I know kids went to a lot of like church, church dances. It wasn't like the, 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 what do you call them, brothers? You know, and the nuns were like the chaperones at the event, <laughs> you know. We were high too. You know, so it wasn't like you, there was a difference of, uh, you know, when we, when we would um, go to a corner, you know, we'd hand out the papers and then we'd get high, you know, and, and if the cops came, we would, and, you know, we would stand up to the cops or we'd, you know, we'd, we'd act appropriately. Um, there was some, there was some cases where there were, you know, it lane, the, the thing with Lane Tech where there was a, one of our guys was like kind of chased away and and beat up a little and so we went back we went back with a bunch of people and fought you know you can't you can't chase our people from you know from the corner and um and so and you know and in fact we were like older and we had a lot of big guys <laughs> and stuff like that and had guns in the in the paper we had we had often a, a gun page, which would talk about. We try to emphasize actually safety and being careful, but it it created a context of like serious revolution, of um, you know about it. You know a lot of us have guns and you know to defend ourselves, and in case the police try to come into our homes or something like that, but. Um, you know, we, I guess we didn't, 
Well, we, we did say off the pig and stuff like that. It was the panther line. And that's something actually probably 40 years later I might have second thoughts about. Um, yeah, that's it's amazing we didn't get, get attacked more by the cops than we did even. But that's because we didn't kill any cops, though. I mean, no white people killed cops. So you could say, you know, there's a little bit of who started it. And if we would have, if there would have been any, you know, if there were some white people going around killing cops, then they would have taken it out on us, whether we, whether we were the ones doing it or not, I think. I just, I'm just thinking yeah. of that now. When you got, to, uh, last month when there were people at the 40th reunion, what were sort of the lessons or summary, like, I wish we would have done this differently or not done that, or what was the, the or was it just feeling good, like, hey, we, we kicked ass? Well, I don't know what your impression was, because you talked to, you know, a little more systematically to people than I did, I guess. My feeling was, I, you know, I don't know why, but I was surprised a little when I came home, that it was um, warmer, warmer and friendlier and nicer than I thought it would be. I don't know why I, I was, I didn't think it would be, there'd be anger or fights or anything like that. But I thought, you know, we did a lot of stupid things. We did a lot of things that um, other people that, or some of us did stupid things that other people in the organization um, would just, I would think, would like to remind them, boy, you were an idiot in those days, you know. And it was kind of, everybody just remembered the positive. Um, but my summary of it um, is what I was saying before, was that it were people remembering what a good effect it had on their lives. Um, and I was surprised how many, you know, this is 40 years later, so if people, let's say, were on the average of 20 years, 18 to... 18 to 25 then. I mean, so the, at the 40th reunion, they were, everybody there was like from 57 to 67 or something like that. And, uh, and people, there were a lot of pictures of grandchildren. And I'm surprised how, I was a little surprised how many inter biracial grandchildren there were. Um, that there was just a openness about, you know, I mean, um, I would think that if, if you took any, if you taken the friends, like say from Sen High School, the white people who graduated from Sen High School, if you had some reunion, 40th reunion, and looked at pictures of grandchildren, the percentage of biracial <laughs> grandchildren would not be as great as they were at this group. That was, uh, that's not a big deal, but it's kind of interesting. And um, people doing all kinds of different things, and there wasn't any sense of, uh, you know, I did, there wasn't any of that, I did better than you, or, because a lot of people uh, are retired, just at retirement age, right? And, or close to it, or wishing they could retire or something. And there didn't seem to be any kind of that competition feeling bad well I'm still poor and looks like you did pretty well for yourself well, nobody asked anybody what kind of car they drive I mean it wasn't you know that kind of stuff and um, it's amazing there were, a, there, were there was uh, a lot of grandchildren or ch children and grandchildren uh, conversations you know the, and it was interesting what people's kids are doing it was um you know, a lot of people doing progressive, uh, still involved in progressive things or similar, you know, uh, you know, people doing union stuff, uh, active or active in, you know, even, or it may not be their job, but active in, um, you know, anti-war things or um, a lot of people were, you know, uh, I think a lot of people worked on the, because it's Chicago, a lot of people worked on the Obama campaign, uh, things like that. So people were, um, I mean, the, the rhetoric is, the, 
the specific, some of the specific ide- hard ideological rhetoric is, I think, was thought about affectionately. Remember when we used to say this or that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, the, you know, the overall thrust, I think, stuck with people. Um, you know, and everybody from the, some people who might, you know, became lawyers and, uh, you know, people who might be like, one guy is a conductor on the railroad and, you know, works with his union and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it, it, my, I mean, my strongest feeling was coming home. I'm glad we did what we did. That I sometimes thought, gee, we were a little like over the edge. <laughs> um, people must have thought we were crazy. We were a little bit, um, I don't want to use any negative, too many like real negative words, but highly focused. I don't know, obsessive. I mean, we work, you know, for young people who. Uh, who weren't overachievers in a lot of ways, a lot of the people. We worked hard. How many of the, of the uh, committed uh, staff, the older, became teachers in schools? Were there any? Yeah, I think so. I mean, just... Um, a lot of their kids became teachers. Um, quite a number of those. Quite a number of, um, like, Mary... Mary's two daughters are... Teachers, and um, several of them, quite a number of nurses, and you know there might even be a, a doctor or two. But because we had the clinic, health clinic, and people who worked, people worked, you know, got introduced to the idea, you know, idea of healthcare and and that kind of thing, um, became, you know, the techni- lab technicians and uh, yep. doctors' assistants and and nurses. Did you get any, any comments, uh, either praise or, or derision, from people who were authorities in the community later, like whether they were police or city council or whatever? Do you ever have any contact to say, well, I'm glad you guys were around because you helped this situation, or did you ever hear any feedback? Well, certainly the ne- in, in like where, where the heartland is, I think the and in the city, you know, among, among city politician, there was a certain status. I think that, you know, when I tell people I was from Rising Up Angry in Chicago, there, it's a similar, I don't want to overstate it, as I think someone saying in the black community, well, I used to, I was a member of the uh, Black Panther Party, that you'd get kind of a, you know, a little eyebrow up of, of respect. And so people who, in, among progressives, we were like, like the, you know, the, the, elite, the elite core of the revolution a little bit. Uh, we thought of ourselves like that, and so it's nice when you, when you, you know, maybe I'm, I'm projecting that, you know. Um, and a lot of the people, you know, we had lawyers and doctors who, uh, who work with us. What, can I, why don't we take a break? Sure, sure. And go in the pool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, your glasses are turning dark, which is... Uh, is that bad? A little, you have a, any clear glasses? I don't need glasses, I guess. Okay, if you could take, take them, them off. off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start at the beginning again to get on this tape. Where you're born, uh, date of birth, oh, okay. that sort of thing. All right, Steve. Your parents. Is it going? Yeah, it's going. Steve Tapas. I was born October 8, 1947 in Brooklyn and grew up uh, in Brooklyn till I was 10 or 11 years old and moved out to Long Island um, with that migration and finished high school in Long Island, in Long Island, Amityville and Merrick. And I uh, did a year of college, community college, and didn't really uh, take the college much. So 
I ended up moving into into New York, get, getting different jobs. About what year was this? Could you, this was 19. Be? I moved into New York in 1967, so I was uh, 19 years old, and got a leaflet. I did different. Early 67, I got different jobs. You know, I ended up as a janitor at the new school, and worked as an elevator operator for a while up on Central Park West. And I got a leaflet for the Pentagon demonstration, and which was an anti-war demonstration in October of 1967, where uh, a lot of people, it was 100,000 people, came very, and it was kind of a, one of the more militant demonstrations. And people, I didn't know what it was. I'd never been to an anti-war demonstration. But it just seemed like a good idea. It just seemed like like something was happening. And uh, I wasn't all that political, but I was facing the draft. And I got a few leaflets and read a little bit about it. And being against the war seemed like a good thing. Civil rights, I, I was already supported civil rights, actually, even in high school. I went to, a, I went to the um, big march on Washington in 1963 where Martin Luther King made the famous speech, which was totally out of context. There was no reason for me to, no one would have thought that I'd go to that. I wasn't involved in anything civil rights uh, related. Um, I lived in a town that was half black, but I'd moved from, the, my parents moved from there into a town on Long Island, which was all white. But it just seemed like, equal rights and civil rights and integration and all that seemed like a, it was only right and it seemed like a big thing. Did that come so, out of uh, your church or religion or no, a liberal democrat background? No, it, it was, I, in a lot of ways it came, out, it came out of nowhere. Now my father was kind of a liberal but he, he wasn't, he didn't talk about it much. I mean, he, so he wasn't opposed to me. Uh, going, and he had worked for a, um, he worked for an, uh, kind of a liberal veterans organization. It was kind of a liberal answer to the American Legion, but it was you know very. It wasn't a militant organization. It was very straight liberal kind of New Republic kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know they supported. They were Adlai Stevenson types, and but he you know I. He didn't have any influence. I didn't even like him. So I mean, so you didn't he, like who? My father, you know. So it wasn't that he influenced me. Um, we didn't get along particularly well, and so I went on that demonstration. I think actually a friend of mine said, "Hey, you want to go on this demonstration?" Talking about '63 or something. It's 1963. Yeah. A friend of mine in high school, we were like four, '63. I'd have been 15 years old. He says, you want to go to Washington this demonstration? I said, it sounds like it might be interesting, you know, get out of this nothing going on place. And then he went and asked his parents and they wouldn't let him go. <laughs> so I, already, I had already asked my parents and they said, fine, go. So I went by myself and I sat by myself on his train. People were very friendly, but I didn't, I wasn't part of a group. I wasn't part of anything. I just sat on the train and um, from Grant Central Station, took the train to Washington, got off the train, marched with everybody else, and uh, marched back, walked back to the train, got on the train, went home. Um, it was, I, and, then, and then I did a, they had my name and phone number and address and all that, and some Long Island coordinating committee for civil rights would call me now and then and ask me if I wanted to hand out leaflets or something like that, and I did. But it, it wasn't something that you could, it was, they were old people, maybe they were church people, something, whatever they were, they weren't people that I, they weren't going to be friends. They were not my f peers. And so um, it was gone, and mostly, uh, you know, I was more into playing pool, and and I was kind of a gambler. So uh, I went off to the off to the city and got jobs, and then 
uh, one day somebody handed me a leaflet, said something about the draft and uh, the Pentagon demonstration. And then I read the Village Voice and there was a full page ad for the uh, for this March on Washington. So I that and on the bottom of the ad it said if you want to volunteer and help out, prepare for this demonstration, come up to the office. So I went up to the office and they had me stuffing envelopes. And um, you know, so I <clears throat> I, t I didn't become real friends with anybody there. Stu Albert was one of the people um, in that room, you know, stuffing envelopes, and I met him. And then I met, you know, some of the other people. But then I had this job at the new school as a janitor, and then an SDS chapter there. So I started going to SDS meetings. And then I went to the Pentagon demonstration, got arrested there, and I came back and... Um, I was inspired, and I, I met people that, I met a lot of people, all of a sudden I changed communities. I was living, I moved to the Lower East Side, um, I started volunteering at the SDS office, and then there was another demonstration, then all of a sudden, there's, in, in that day, during, in those days, there were demonstrations every week somewhere. There were protests. Um, All about the same subject, or mostly, yeah, mostly the war, you know, or international things. Um, uh, then che, Gu che Guevara was killed on my birthday that year, and there were, you know, demonstrations, uh, anti-imperialist thing, and then there would be some kind of, um, you know, civil rights related, related stuff, and then all of a sudden I'm. You know, like overnight, I was part of the movement, and there no close friendships in, in that that were furthering that. You were a loner within the movement. No, no, no. So one that that was there was that was a shift. All you know. Then after the when I bite when I came back from the demonstration and why I went to the demonstration in Washington as as a loner, and I met people on the bus and I got a ride down there with people who were uh, street theater people. And they, I just loved them. They were, just, they were the greatest. It was just a whole different world of people. It what was, they do, they have puppets or? They did, they had um, big paper. It was, the play was the War Monster play <laughs> that we performed in the street with these big paper mache, I guess you call them puppets. Uh, and I was in a, a, we, in a van with them and I got a ride from New York, and they, a couple of people got separated from the group, so they needed some help. So we had this dragon type puppet, and they, two people would be, and it was the war monster, and then they had a guy who was dressed kind of like, uh, you know, the businessman in the Monopoly game with the, with the top hat, and he would uh, feed children and, and soldiers and, um, and airplanes and bombs to the to the war monster, and then the war monster would turn around and shit money uh, to the to the businessman, and I was the one in the in the back uh, handing out the the money, so that was my theatrical debut, and and so then I got so then they you know would drive back and they had a loft and down in, uh, in the deep Lower East Side of Manhattan and they had rent parties on Friday night and, and sang folk songs and I met other people there and then I started to work at the SDS office and then I made, and you know, now I'm part of a community. Now I have friends, now I'm one, you know, it, it, one great thing about it, about that, you know, there's a culture going, all of my hair now by that time was getting a little longer. Um, you know, it's people who smoke dope, people who listen to a lot of music, and all of a sudden I was part of this new community on the Lower East Side. And um, I have to say, out in the suburbs where I'd lived, you didn't know how to get from, from where you knew these things were going on. You know, you could drive into the city and, and look around and you might see some hippies, but then you think, well, how could they be your friend? You know, you would even say, you know, you parents can't set up a play date and all of a sudden now I had uh, I I changed communities I got I moved from this 
kind of um, suburban, know-nothing community, all-white community to uh, um, to a uh, uh, group of people who thought that they were, <laughs> in a sense, were the center of the world, were right where it was happening. And, um, you know, and you'd meet people who were kind of sort of famous, you know, and um, you even you do things that got covered in the newspaper, you know, like demonstrations and stuff. It was exciting. And I spent that next year, you know, went to all the different demonstrations. I was at Columbia for the uh, student strike. I was in a building there for uh, 10 days, in the math building. And, and, and working at SDS, I raised money f to get a new office and um, set up a print shop. And I learned how to print. And one thing that, I mean, it's probably not as true now in the, with the internet, but in those days, printing was a very valuable uh, skill. That there were never enough printers. Because nobody joins a, a movement so that they can sit in a tiny room running a printing press getting covered with ink. Um, you need for somebody to do that. So when I did that, um, I became sought after, and so uh, some people from from Chicago came to talk to me, Jeff Jones and Bernadine, I think, and uh, and said that I they wanted me to move to Chicago and work in the SDS national office, and I said I didn't want to just print, and they said no, no, you do you could be campus traveler and you can like coordinate things and do this and that, and so I moved out to Chicago. And um, from there, I met Mike James, uh, who was not rising up angry, he didn't exist at the time. He was a member of JOIN, which did community organizing in Uptown in Chicago. And so, you know, I hung around with him, uh, other people in the national office, and then I met this guy, Noel Ignaton, who was uh, doing factory organizing at International Harvester. And he convinced me that I should go work in a factory. And I worked at International Harvester down on 31st Street and Western Avenue on the south, near south side of Chicago. And it's since been shut down. But, um, and we, <clears throat> so at this time I was working I did some stuff for SDS, I was working in the factory, um, and I was hanging around with Mike James, who was trying to put together, Join fell apart, Join ended, and so he wanted to start a new organization and put out a newspaper. Let's talk about, in terms of someone hearing this, the big picture is what were these people organizing to do, and what was their uh, vision, or what did they expect to happen? Could you kind of tell that? you're telling it to a complete stranger from the future? <clears throat> um, well, the, the major issues, the major issue was uh, was the war in Vietnam. Let me just get a hold of <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, people were upset about the war in well, Again, the my first, first time when I said I went to the demonstration, I thought of that as an anti-war demonstration. There's a war, it's a bad war, the liberals don't like it, the conservatives do. I quickly learned, when I, at the, uh, I remember with the pageant players, the theater group, coming back on the bus, uh, not on the, uh, on the, in their van, and I'm, and I'm sitting talking, you know, with the other people. Now, they were... They, they were smart and they were, they'd been political for a long time. I'd been political for about a week and a half. And although I, I immediately thought I kind of like joined the church. And now I'm part of the anti-war movement. I'm an anti-war guy and um, countercultural or whatever, against the establishment. So it's all, all those things went together. I mean, it was a whole culture. I like, it was rock and roll. It was... Um, it was Bob Dylan. It was protest mu music. It was uh, it was dancing in the streets and theater, 
and getting high and smoking dope and and anti-establishment and hippie clothes and no more suits and that kind of stuff. So there was a real count. So we lived in, in a count. We had our own culture. Um, and in addition, but we, we were the political ones of that culture. So a lot of people who were, everybody who was a hippie wasn't reading political tracts at night. They were, um, some people just, you know, liked the music and liked to dance or something, you know. But on the other hand, they were anti-establishment in that they were anti-authoritarian, didn't want to be, you know. This was a time when colleges still had dress codes. Um, women women had curfews, in a, you know. In a, this was about the time when they were protesting that. Depends on what, if you were in a college in New York City, the women probably didn't have different curfews from the, the girls didn't have different curfews from the boys in those days. But in small colleges around, you know, and not in the city, um, it was, it was this, that hadn't changed since the 1950s. There were, uh, you know, mixed race dating wasn't, you know, raised eyebrows in the, in the mid to late 60s. Um, and feminism was, I guess it was, um, it was there when I first came into the movement, I didn't know about it, but it didn't take long. I'd say, you know, by 19, the beginning of 19, 